everyone. I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash, and this is episode 43 of the podcast series. Is that right? I always have to check these things. Anyway, welcome. It's nice to see you all. I'm actually kind of weirdly, blissfully, I don't know if it's blissfully, I'm weirdly alone on this Saturday afternoon because my son is playing soccer in Springfield, and my husband is on his way back from a trip, and the only other being with me here, which you may be able to hear in the background, is the latest addition to our family, Millie, who is Tink's sister. And for those of you who have been watching for a while, you know that we have a dog named Tink, and she's really adorable, and she's often featured in my husband's um, prison bus series videos. Uh, and we knew from the beginning when we adopted her that um, she had a sister at the same shelter, and another family was going to adopt the sister at the time. So we were really, we were like, oh my god, she had a sister, let's get her. And then the the pound the the shelter was like no she's already been spoken for so the cool thing was we stayed in touch with her family um for the past year and shared some information back and forth and kind of like how they were doing and what they were up to and we saw photos of everybody um and just just last week i got a facebook message from um her mom, the other mom, uh, who said, you know, they're, they're having some family things going on and just like, like crazy kind of family life at the moment. And they couldn't really take care of Tink's sister anymore. And they wanted to know if we wanted her. So what were we to do? Of course we said yes. So Millie has come to join the family and she is a lot like Tink, except she's just hairier and a little bigger. Which is, I think Tink might've been the run to the litter and Millie was kind of like the big lady of the litter. So they are, they haven't met yet, actually. This is kind of interesting. Since my husband, since Spencer's on his way back um, from a trip, he had Tink for the trip since I was in Germany. Long story. Uh, and he's on his way back with Tink. I don't know if you can hear Millie breathing in the background. She's laying on the floor right here, just kind of like. <sighs> um, so they haven't met yet, and we're planning on getting a little video of them meeting because I think that would be good. I'm going to see if I can get her up here. Go up here for a second, Millie. Oh, this is Millie. She is a sweetheart, and she looks a lot like Tink, only she's hairier. You say hi, Millie. Hi, Millie. Yeah, no, you're breathing very hard. Millie is not quite in the kind of shape that Tink is in, so we've been working on that um, slowly this week. She was introduced to the dog park. We've been taking walks in the neighborhood. She's got paws that are um, very soft, and ha she hasn't really been out on the sidewalks and stuff very much, so I'm hoping that her breathing isn't just overrunning this whole episode but if it is it is we love our dogs around here she's looking out the window right now uh so that's the story of millie and she and tink will meet and we will get some footage and have to share with you guys what happens when two sisters are reunited at long last after a year apart uh they're both really friendly and fun dogs and they both seem to like other <laughs> dogs a lot and millie's making a bed on the floor right now so while I am alone this weekend in terms of humans, I am not alone in terms of other life forms. And Millie is certainly really, really sweet and nice to have around. Okay, if she'll settle down, I will continue. So, what are we doing on today's episode? Well, first of all, I should introduce myself, which I haven't really quite done. I'm Melissa. Um, I live in Urbana-Champaign, where I'm a professor. Uh, and you can find me just about everywhere as Knitting the Stash on Ravelry and Instagram and YouTube, obviously, and on the blog, which is knittingthestash.wordpress.com. And it is a rainy day here. It has just started raining. Um, like I said, my son's away at a soccer game. I hope he's staying dry enough. Uh, well, we shall see when he gets home on the bus later. Um, in today's episode, I've got a few things for you. I'm calling this one Cologne, Cashmere, and Conservancy. So I want to talk to you about the trip to Cologne um, and the yarn shops I found there. Uh, I finally can introduce you to the sample knits I did for June Cashmere. Uh, and I'm going to insert a segment here from way back when, when I finished those knits, so I can show you what they were. Uh, and I want to talk a little about conservancy and um, thinking about um, how and why you can support small producers um, and why it might be important to do so. So... Why don't we jump right in with Cologne? <laughs> um, I traveled to Cologne, Germany to give a talk uh, uh, at a symposium um, that was about brain hacking. It was at the Cologne Futures uh, 2018 event, and there were um, 
it was a really nice small group of presenters and a nice crowd and it was all in German so I speak French but not German and that was an interesting uh, existential exercise and kind of like sitting and listening to academic German and kind of having some idea of what they were talking about um, so I had read some of the papers but not totally understanding what they were talking about <laughs> so it was really it was really great um, my talk was about um, the neuroscientific turn and um, EEG wearables, which is what my new book is about. And I don't talk too much about my research on the podcast, but that's why I was in Cologne to begin with. That's what got me there. And whenever I go to any of these cities, I love to just do a little yarn crawl. So I, so I went to two uh, yarn stores when I was in Cologne, uh, and one was Laura's Bulletin. Wooladen, I think is how you say it. And the second was the Garn store. And I have a little card for the Garn store, which I think is pretty cool. They have a great little logo, um, aside from Knit Be Happy is this. And you can find them on um, Ravelry and Instagram if you wanted to friend them or follow them um, so you can see what they're up to. Uh, my favorite of the two was the Garn store. Garn store. Um, and the reason for that is that they had tons of breed specific wool, wool from around the world, stuff I had never seen before. It was beautifully arranged. Um, I just felt really like at home there. It was one of those shops where I could have spent days and days and bless you. If I lived in Cologne, I would be back there like every week. I'd be signing up to take classes or teach classes or something and just be browsing all the yarn all the time. Um, I really, really loved that shop. So the first, when I visited them, um, the first thing I picked up, because I'm thinking I'm traveling, I don't want to carry a lot back with me. Mm, yarn doesn't weigh that much, but... Um, and I love printed patterns, so I found um, Carol Feller's Dark Pearl pattern, which is knit in Titus. Over here, sorry, Titus. Um, and I picked this up um, because I love Carol Feller's um, patterns, and she was actually the first craftsy teacher I think I ever took a class with. Uh, I learned cables from her. She's just, she's like, she has a big place in my heart. And this pattern is really quite beautiful. The tightest yarn is an alpaca blend. And you can see why you'd want like an alpaca blend for the sweater. It's very drapey. It has a whole lace front panel. Um, and so I'm really, and it has these beautiful, um, this beautiful detail with the buttons up the side. So I'm really kind of excited to knit that. And it took me a little while to get back to the yarn stores in between um, some other meetings and things, but let me make a little noise here. I did buy a sweater's worth of yarn, and I know I didn't have that much room in my my bag. I carry just a small, very small bag when I go traveling, like literally a backpack um, where I put all my clothes. I like tend to wash my clothes in the sinks in the hotels and like wear them again um, because when you're in Europe, uh, I don't know, it just seems like the thing to do and. I hate checking bags and I hate carrying a lot of stuff because usually I'm walking everywhere. Um, so I'll walk for exercise in the airport or I'll walk when I get to town. Um, if not from the airport, then everywhere in town carrying my stuff. So sometimes I arrive early in the morning and I can't check into the hotels until two or three. Anyway, this is my philosophy about traveling in Europe is pack light. So I do, um, except on my way home, I often carry sweaters worth of yarn. <laughs> so this is the tightest that I chose for that sweater. Um, and Titus is 70% British wool and 30% uh, UK alpaca, um, and it's uh, spun and dyed in Yorkshire. So it's a kind of uh, place-specific wool from Ba Ramu, and I think I've talked about Ba Ramu on here before. Um, 350 yards for um, 100 grams, and you can see, because it has all that alpaca in it, it has some really cool drape. You know, yarn will otherwise stand up pretty well if it's just wool, but with that alpaca, it really does have um, a beautiful kind of drape to it as you just kind of hold it. Um, and so this sweater is going to be very drapey, lacy, open, um, very, very pretty, and I'm I'm really pretty excited about that. Uh, I, they didn't have quite the color. I, I don't normally knit with a red, though I do like red as like a jewel tone. Um, I wanted to get a, a kind of beautiful gray or blue or a kind of different kind of um, dusky pink salmon-y kind of color, but they didn't quite have, uh, I needed four skeins. So I picked the next best thing and I'm pretty happy with this red. I think it'll show, show itself up pretty well. The other thing I picked up, and I'm opening it, sorry, it's gonna make some noise is this really funky um, Addy sweater shaver. <laughs> I, I love Addy. I have all um, interchangeable needles from them. They're just my favorite uh, company for that kind of thing. Um, but this is just like a, it's like a sweater saver. Um, what it says on the tag is, 
Pilling is a natural process which may occur after the garment is used, and this product helps you keep your cashmere and other wools um, beautiful and maintain their original appearance. You hold the garment with one hand and draw the comb lightly and quickly over the surface with the other. So I'm going to try it out um, on some of my sweaters, but I do have... I do have some alpaca mitts here, and you can see it's kind of just pulling off the little bits. Um, it just kind of gives it a nice little shave. That's kind of cool. So I, I was just excited to see one of these. I thought it was kind of a neat novelty, and I wanted to bring one home. So for like a couple of euros, it's a really cool thing to have. Um, and that's all the shopping I did for the yarn store. Um, but I do want to insert some pictures here. I They had a wonderful selection of, uh, let's see... Uh, they had some Mad Tosh, which I hadn't seen in a while. Um, they had um, some indie dyers like um, Hedgehog Fibers. They had a whole shelf of Hedgehog Fibers. Um, they had yarn from Denmark. They had yarn um, from Britain, uh, from around the UK. Uh, just a beautiful selection, lots of colors, just wonderful. And the people there were just really sweet. Um, I, I love that yarn shop. It, it felt like home walking through that door. So if you ever are in Cologne and you have a chance to go to um, the Gowern store. Oh, and the light is really just coming in right now. I don't know if this is going to work. There you go. Go to the Gowern store. You should totally do it. Um, I love them. And I want to go back and hang out with them more. <laughs> uh, the other store, um, Laura's Willowden, was... Uh, impressive in a different kind of way. It struck me as more of like, um, they, they carried more of like mainstream yarns, like things like um, in the US would be like, um, I think the equivalent of like uh, Cascade and um, maybe some Brooklyn Tweed, like that kind of, you know, like a range from all the way from Cascade up to like a Brooklyn Tweed. Um, they just seemed like more mainstream, a little less um, import kind of um, importation kind of uh, going on there. Uh, some beautiful, I've never seen so much opal sock yarn, that, like a huge shelf of it. Um, lots of cool alpaca. They had, um, I think it was called Cowgirls Sing the Blues uh, yarn from, it was from South Africa, uh, which I hadn't seen before. They had singles and um, some mohair, which I had a hard time resisting. And I just it, that was hard <laughs> to resist. Um, and they had some beautiful little buttons and stitch markers and lots of patterns, lots of German pattern books, which were really fun to see, kind of popular pattern books. Um, so that was the other store I visited. And like I said, I'll put in some pictures here so that you can come on my little yarn crawl with me. Um, I didn't have time to go to some of the stores that were a little farther out of the city center where I was um, staying, uh, but I had fun at those two places. So it was it was a good trip. It was it was worthwhile going. I ended up with a sweater's worth of yarn and a sweater pattern, um, and I knit all the way there and back on some beautiful old crow art yarn, um, a skein called Sidthe. S-I-D-H-E, uh, which is like this beautiful variegated skein, and I'll show you in the next episode um, when I'll have more time. The differences, I made the uh, the same shawl that I made for the pearl and ply variegated skein with this Old Crow Art yarn, which is a much more um, bolder kind of primary color um, palette for the skein, and I'll show you um, in the next episode what that looks like and what the differences are. You know, if you're doing a pattern like Vary the Gate, which is made for variegated yarn, and you do it with a subtle skein, kind of like the one um, from Pearl and Ply, versus a skein that really does pop with a lot of primary colors, um, the difference that you'll see uh, in the finished product. So we'll talk about that next time. Uh, but I had fun knitting on the plane, knitting in all the waiting rooms, knitting in the <laughs> on the bus, like, uh, you know, everywhere. It's kind of like what I do to stay sane. I, I saw a meme recently that was like, I don't knit because I'm patient. I knit to stay patient. Um, and that's pretty much the story of my life. Um, but it was it was worth it. And I only, I talked myself into only bringing one skein of yarn for the trip for knitting because I thought, well, this is the, you know, the amount of hours that it takes to finish a shawl will be this many hours. And I, I was pretty right. I have about this much little tiny ball of yarn left to knit on that shawl and then I'll be done with it. So it worked out pretty, pretty well, I think. Uh, so that's Cologne, and what I'd like to do now is insert the video from a few weeks back that I made about the June cashmere samples that I knit, uh, and so I'll see you on the flip side of that. 
So I'm just about to send my sample knits back to June Cashmere, and I wanted to record a segment of the podcast all about the knitting process of those sample knits, uh, talk a little bit about their fall collection, and uh, just give you a kind of update on these things before I send them off in the post. Um, so in a previous episode, I talked about June Cashmere, and they are a company that started in about 2016. They harv they uh, collect. <laughs> Look at this goat. They collect cashmere from um, small farming families in Kyrgyzstan uh, from their cashmere goats. And uh, they've been trying to put together a more transparent, kind of sustainably sourced uh, cashmere source for folks in the US. Uh, and I was working on a few different sample knits for them. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, a hat and mitt set, but I actually was working on a, a hat and a hat and mitt set. So let me first show you, um, this is the Juniper Hat and Fingerless Gloves by uh, Lisa Hoffman. And here's one mitt and the other mitt I will put on here so you can see it. Um, they're really quite pretty. Uh, and they, these are going to come out in the fall collection for June Cashmere, uh, which I will uh, happily post a link to in the show notes of this episode. Uh, these mitts are knit from the bottom cuff up to the top uh, in three different colors of June cashmere. Uh, and let me pull up the colors so that you can see. Um, this one, the green is sea glass, the blue is June sky, and the pink is called stone crop. And it's a really cool pattern. This is a, like I said, it's a Lisa Hoffman pattern and it has some nice uh, three bow and ribbing that kind of pulls those mitts right into your hands and makes them feel really comfortable. Uh, it's, it's what I would consider to be a kind of afterthought thumb. There's no um, gusset increases for the thumb in these mitts. You're basically knitting the tube of the mitt uh, and leaving some stitches on waist yarn that you then um, pick up later and pull together your thumb. Produces a really nice, um, join there, which I think you can see. Yes, there you go. Uh, and this beautiful uh, cable pattern, which is on both of the mitts, is continued on the hat, which is this guy. It's a beautiful and so soft. This yarn is amazingly soft. Once I've washed these uh, just once, um, but the difference between the unwashed and the washed is pretty incredible. This hat is, uh, like I said, it continues that a uh, beautiful cable pattern in three different colors. So you have your accent color up here at the top, and then that accent color, whatever color you choose, uh, you use for your main color for your mitts. See, see, there's a nice kind of synergy going on there. I'll show you what the hat looks like <laughs> on my head. It's kind of a cool, like, slouchy hat. You could pull it a bunch of different ways. I would kind of tuck it in the back like this, and the colors, I bet, kind of pop. I'm not sure if you can see that. Um, the other way I would imagine you could wear this very easily would be to kind of fold up the, if you really wanted it sitting down in your head, you could fold up the brim. And that cable pattern is so beautiful that it kind of sits in the opposite, uh, on, the, on the wrong side. It looks quite beautiful too. Um, you get that nice pop of color. It has a cool crown, different kinds of decreases uh, than I would typically do in a hat, but it produces this perfectly round crown on the top of the hat, which I think is kind of cool. So that is the Juniper mitts and fingerless mitts and hat set that will be coming out in the June cashmere fall collection. Really a joy to knit with this yarn. I mean, I just can't tell you how soft these feel. I am really looking forward to um, knitting up um, some more of this for a hat of my own or some other little accessories, I think. Um, now this, the other pattern I did for them, and both of these were kind of test knit sample knits slash sample knits. Uh, this is, uh, this hat doesn't have, didn't yet have a name at the time when I was uh, working on it. So what I'm going to do is post the name of this hat down below so that you can find it on the June Cashmere website and on Ravelry. It is by Mary Lou Egan, who is a designer who has designed tons of stuff. If you go on Ravelry and check out Mary Lou Egan's patterns, she has a lot of different, a variety up there and some really cool stuff. Um, I just friended her on, on Ravelry recently after looking up all of her patterns. Um, hi, Mary Lou Egan. <laughs> so this is her hat, and I'll show you in the light on my head. It's a great all-over cable pattern that starts, uh, you start from the brim and you work up to the crown on this hat, 
and it has these beautiful, I was calling it kind of the accordion hat because um, as I was knitting it, 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 these cables make everything kind of collapse in on themselves until you wash it and then everything sits really nicely uh, and lays really cool. I'll show you the crown. Has some really nice decreases and continues the pattern kind of all the way up to the top. Uh, and this hat is not slouchy. It really just sits right on your head. Um, right to the, the top of my head is right there. It just feels really comfortable. And this cashmere, oh my god, cashmere is so soft. I love these hats. Um, I'm not a huge hat knitter, but I would knit uh, have my, all the rest of my hats for the rest of my life out of cashmere because the feel of that on your head is pretty uh, incredible. Uh, so let me show you up close what that pattern looks like. It's a really, really cute pattern. And I do love the decreases at the top on this one. A little, a little bit, um, they're a little bit more like the style that I would knit. Uh, the decreases to a hat, so you can see the top there. It comes down to a nice little point. Um, the inside, as always, you gotta turn your knitting inside out and it should be just as good on the inside. Uh, because you have the cable pattern, you get this cool effect on the inside. And that's your, your top. So you could wear this either way. I particularly like the cables on the outside though. So another beautiful pattern, Mary Lou Egan. Very great. And uh, way to go June Cashmere on this uh, fall collection. Congratulations. Uh, I'm excited to see it out into the world and excited to see these knits go off into whatever use they're going to be for you <laughs> out in the world. So thanks so much for the opportunity to sample knit. Uh, June Cashmere, I will put the um, link to their shop uh, in the show notes. And uh, I'll show you one more time all the different um, shades of yarn you can get from them. They do both a lace and a DK. And these, this is the shade card for their most recent shade card. And it's just, as I showed you before on the other episode, all the way from a natural to a beautiful kind of curry. Um, and then you've got your greens, uh, your mossy greens, all the way to your slate blues and your purples over here and your pinks. Just really beautiful stuff. Um, wonderful to work with, beautiful once it uh, kind of washes and softens up, and so I, I recommend it. I was really, I had a great time sample knitting for them. Um, so that's the June Cashmere segment. I hope you enjoyed uh, checking out those samples from June Cashmere. The neat thing is, I think only one of those patterns has been officially released, and the other pattern you just got a little sneak peek of before they release the pattern this week, um, or early next week. So joy. Uh, I loved working with their yarns. It was really a joy. Uh, all right, we had cologne. We had cashmere. And now for some conservancy. <laughs> uh, now, you don't have to be totally into like homesteading or tree hugging or any of those other uh, more liberal ways of being to be a conser conservationist. Um, conservancy can just simply be about thinking about the value in um, different ways of doing things and in recognizing that there are multiple older ways of doing things that may not be um, totally represented by our kind of more modern industrial world. Um, whether or not you buy into it with your time or your money, that's totally up to you. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about conservancy um, as a kind of idea and because I was uh, kind of confronted with two different examples of it this week that I thought were interesting and something I'd pass on to you guys. So I was introduced to conservancy and ideas about conservancy from Sarah Fibertrek, and she's often talking about people and place and time and um, the importance of the stories behind um, the yarns that we use and the fiber that we use. And I've often just kind of bought into it um, because I think it's cool. You often get to meet new people and check out uh, yarn that you wouldn't find just everywhere um, by kind of following the story of the yarn. So I like it just as a as a consumer and a knitter. I like just want to, it, it makes it more interesting to me to know the story behind a yarn. Um, but the two things that came across my radar this week uh, helped me, I guess, consolidate a little bit about why it's also really important to um, support kind of uh, conservancy ideas when it comes to yarn and sheep and fiber and all kinds of things. And one of them was um, a really great episode of Chef's Table, which is a documentary series on Netflix. And if you haven't checked it out, it's worth checking out if you're into food and uh, foodways and that kind of stuff. Um, this particular episode was about um, a woman who had immigrated to America, uh, but she wanted to be serving the food that she served, at, what, that she ate as a child. And she found that a lot of the ingredients that she needed to make that food just weren't available anymore, um, either in her home country or in the U.S. Um, 
And so she started kind of hunting down these people who were still making the products that she remembered um, by hand, often taking a lot of extra time and um, effort. And one of the one that I remember uh, most specifically is pa the palm sugar that she needed. And uh, part of the documentary showed um, these folks making palm sugar. And it was this amazing process. It reminded me a little bit of like ma making maple syrup. Um, and to think about like that product, which you can't really make and produce and ship and preserve in, in the right kinds of ways if you want to put it on an industrial scale. So the only way to have that product is actually to go to the small producer and get it directly. And I think a lot of yarn and fiber, Millie agrees with me, is like that. Um, if you want to get certain breeds, you want to um, have certain kinds of um, fiber for specific projects, you know, if you're making a rug versus a blanket versus a, an outerwear coat versus a hat or a scarf or something like that, these are all based on um, like there are there are better breeds of sheep to use for the, each of those different kinds of products. Um, so so this chef's table thing got me thinking about why it's so important to support those kind of small producers because if you don't, then those ways of life and those knowledge and and all that stuff will go away. Um, and if you do, then you are getting away from this kind of industrial model and you're getting back to a model where. Um, you know, an individual's knowledge and preparation and their ability to make a product really matter. So I just thought that was kind of cool to think about it that way. Um, and at the same time, I got an email from the Livestock Conservancy, um, which I thought was kind of right up, uh, right up our alley here. Um, so the Livestock Conservancy, if you guys haven't heard about this, they're launching a program in 2019 called Shave em to Save em. <laughs> And the idea is to kind of preserve these heritage breeds of sheep. And when I was looking through it, I thought, well, that's a really, it, it kind of fit with that chef's table idea. Um, and if you go to their website, basically what they are going to do in 2019 is create a kind of passport looking document that you can get stamped for, by small producers or you can stamp yourself um, when you purchase or use yarn or fiber from one of these um, conservancy breeds or heritage breeds. Um, and there's also going to be a Facebook group and a Ravelry group um, where members can, like, they say, share pictures of their projects and work their way through their breeds. There, there might be prizes um, for landmark um, kind of moments in your, in your work. And you can just sign up um, really simply on their website, um, which I will link to in the show notes if you're interested in just following along, uh, checking it out as a, pro a project that's going on and kind of connecting with other people who are interested in this kind of thing. Uh, but I like that idea. You know, I think it's kind of interesting to think about um, the different breeds of sheep and using them in very specific ways for specific projects. So that's your little bit about conservancy, thinking about those small producers and why it does matter if you choose to support them um, rather than like bigger box stores or industrial ways now. Now, I will tell you, I am not someone who doesn't buy superwash yarn. I'm not someone who won't go to a big box store and buy something I need. Um, but I, so I'm not, you know, a whole hog under this thing saying like, I will only live life one way and I will only do one, you know, there's only one thing that's worthwhile because I think living rigidly like that can, you know, it can, it can deprive you of, of a full kind of experience of the world and, and deprive you of a chance to really look at the differences between buying from a small producer and buying from a big producer. So I'm definitely not here on a soapbox saying you must conserve. Um, I just think it's really interesting to think about what gets conserved and what doesn't in our modern world. And um, I think it's useful to kind of, once you have that information, to think about where you stand and what you actually care about, what you want to do and what matters to you. Um, and then you can kind of put yourself somewhere on that spectrum and, you know, pick and choose a little bit here, a little bit there, whatever works for you. So I just think it's something that it's great to be aware of, that these things are going on, that there are these ideas out there, that people are thinking about this and encouraging um, others to get in touch with these small producers and think about their stories and their knowledge and value it in one way or another, whether it's monetarily or just, you know, in a conversation like this where we can talk about why it would be important to support um, there's a the thunder, why it might be so important to support um, some of these other producers. Like, you know, and I include June Cashmere in that, um, and I include uh, a lot of the indie designers and dyers and hand knitters that I work with, um, and the farmers. I just think they're cool people, and it's fun to learn their stories. And if this is an excuse to learn their stories, awesome. So I think that's about it for today. The storm is blowing in like crazy. I have a brand new puppy in the other room who I 
think we'll be okay with Thunder, but I don't know. So I'm going to go and give her a little cuddle and <laughs> say goodbye to you guys for now and hope to see you in a couple of weeks. Enjoy your knitting in the meantime, and I will talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.